There's a verse that says that our Father rejoices over us with song. Do you know your God sings over you? I don't ever want you, if you hear that song on the radio, I don't ever want you to hear it the same way again, that no matter what happens, that you have a Father in heaven who's with you and who's actually singing over your life. I'm going to tell you about a story. During the Civil War, there was a soldier of the Union Army who had lost his older brother and his father. And the young man, he began to think about his sister and his mother who were back on the farm and what they would do that spring for the planting and the harvesting and the repairs and all the things. And he began to, to, to feel like he was most needed not on the battlefield, but on the fields of his home where there was no one to do these things. And so finally, torn between these two desires, he traveled to Washington, D.C. to plead his case to the person that he knew could help him. President Lincoln. He arrived at the nation's capital. He went up to the White House. Naively, he approached the doors and he asked to see the president. However, he was told, you can't see the president. You know there's a war going on. In fact, why don't you get back to the battlefield where you belong? He left, walked away, and he was very discouraged. He walked a short distance and sat there in a little park on a bench near the White House. A young boy was playing somewhat close by and the young boy saw him his head bowed, sitting there sadly, and the lad walked over and said, you look like something's wrong. Are you okay? The soldier looked up, and in his grief, he began to tell the little boy just a, a couple of the facts and how he was here to see the president, but was unable to do so. Something amazing happened at this point in the story. The little boy looked at the soldier and said, put out his hand and said, come with me. And he grabbed the soldier's hand. The soldier grabbed his hand, and the little boy began to lead him around the backside of the White House. In fact, they got there and went through the back door. To the man's amazement, they walked past some guards. They looked him up and down as he walked by. He walked by officials and people scurrying to and fro. And finally, he reached the outside of the president's office, and the soldier did not know what to do other than to do nothing, be quiet and follow. The little boy at this point didn't even knock and instead just opened the door and burst into the president's office where there was President Lincoln sat at his desk with the Secretary of State looking over some papers. President Lincoln looked up at the soldier and then the young lad and said, hey buddy, can you introduce me to your friend? And Todd Lincoln said, daddy, this soldier needs to talk to you about something. You see, a son has access to a father unlike anyone else. And access is everything. When you have access, it changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, have you ever had VIP passes to an event? You ever been like backstage, on the field? Have you guys ever had these passes where, where, where no one else really gets to go, but, but you know somebody and they got you back there? You know, and you got to Instagram the whole thing and put the whole thing up, but you got back there. You got the pictures with the people. Access is everything. And it's everything about our topic today as well. You know, we've been discussing something called the tabernacle. We're in the book of Exodus, this ancient book here at the beginning of the Bible. We've been marching through looking at God's people as they've left slavery and then in the wilderness. And then God tells them to build him a place where his presence can come down. Remember, this is the account of a God who wants to be with his people. From the first page to the end, it's a God who dwells with his people, and eventually that is how it will be with us. And so he tells, as they travel there through the wilderness, to build me a tabernacle. He gives them specific instructions down to the measurements, down to what materials to use, and how he would come down and fill the place. And once it was completed, his presence would come down and dwell there. And again, let me draw, draw it quickly. There were outer courts. And within the outer courts, and we've gone through each of these furnishings and we've talked about them. The first one was this altar that was set up. The outer courts right here, you'd come and there was an altar where they would offer sacrifices for forgiveness. And then they would get to the laver, this basin where they would wash and each of these symbolically reflects onto Jesus and how Jesus was our sacrifice to forgive us, but also how his word and we, we were washing and being purified and made more and more holy in character when we engage in his word. And then you get to the tabernacle building itself. 
And the tabernacle building is split into two sections by a veil. A veil divides it. The first section you would see as you walk in the tabernacle, you would see a table over here. We discussed this, and it has 12 loaves of bread. This is called the show bread, or the bread of presence, relating to Jesus being the bread of life. Across from the bread, there would be a big menorah, candles, candles, a lampstand that would light. And then right here, last week or a couple weeks ago, we talked about the altar of incense. And each of these parts of the tabernacle, we looked at how they are a billboard pointing forward to something, or more specifically to somebody. And how back here in, tab- in the Old Testament, God had them build them a place that points forward to Jesus, but it doesn't just stop there. The beauty of what God has done is it continues to point forward, and it's going to be relevant to you today. This ancient structure, and what we're talking about today, is right here, it's this veil. We're talking about this today, because on the other side of the veil is the Ark of the Covenant, and here, this is called the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies is this part of the room, and this is where God's presence would reside. This is the place where the fire of God would descend and be with his people. And access is everything. In the Old Testament, back when the tabernacle was established, before the cross, the people needed a mediator to go into the presence of God for them. You may have heard of a mediator. Usually in our culture, it's a, it has to do with law, right? A mediator goes between two parties. Well, back then, the mediator would go between God's presence and the people, someone who would go. It was a priest, and the high priest would go for sacrifices and for prayer and for forgiveness, a mediator. The tabernacle is divided into different sections, and each one is more sacred and holy and more exclusive than the last. All the people would be out here in the outer courts. Some could go in here to the altar, but only the priests could go then to labor. Even a fewer amount of priests could go into the tabernacle. The priests would go over here to the the bread, he would trim the wicks, and go to the incense. But when it came to the Holy of Holies, only one priest could go into that room. And he could only go in there one time a year. That's how exclusive this was. Certain place, a certain priest going into a certain place. Now, in the, it says this in Exodus 26. Inside the tabernacle, make a special curtain of woven linen, decorate it with blue and purple and scarlet thread with skillfully embroidered cherubim. Hang this curtain on gold hooks attached to the four posts of acacia wood. Hang this curtain from class and the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it, the Holy of Holies in the Ark and the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the Holy of Holies. So behind this curtain is the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And inside the Ark were some amazing elements, and and God's presence would come there upon the mercy seat and reside there. You can imagine how sacred it is if only one person has access, and they can only go in once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Then the high priest to even go in there had to go through all these rituals of of every single one of them, all this ritual cleansing to be purified, to be able to go into the presence of God. He, He could have no unconfessed or unforgiven sin because if the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies and was not completely sanctified and pure, it would perish in the presence of God. His humanity would perish in the presence of a holy God. In fact, God commanded Moses to make sure that the high priest wore bells on their robe when they went in. And this was believed so that people would know when they're still alive and moving in there. If the bells stop jingling, we have a problem. In fact, there's another ancient writing that talks about how they, would, they got to the point where they would tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest. Because if the bells stop ringing and something went wrong in there, we have to get him out. <laughs> It's a holy and sacred place. You can see now how serious this would be, how solemn this place would be. It's a huge responsibility for this high priest to be the mediator between God's presence and all the people who would be outside. Now, he would enter into this holy place, the holy of holies, with incense and blood. 
He would burn the incense there in God's presence and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat here in the ark for the forgiveness of all the people who were outside waiting. And this moment would have been a sacred moment. They would have waited with bated breath and this holiest of moments, knowing that while they're out here, that inside the Holy of Holies, on that day, there is a high priest who stands in the presence of God on their behalf and who's offering a sacrifice for their forgiveness. He was in there. The high priest would go where the people could not go to do what they could not do so they could live as God desired and be forgiven once a year on Yom Kippur. It's, it's amazing to think about this holy of holies in terms of access. One person, once a year, has to be purified. If not, it could be fatal. And you can see why the high priest would enter the tabernacle. They, they, they did it daily, but they dared not go in there and they dared never go in there when they weren't supposed to. And that veil right here hung to separate the divinity from humanity. The veil separated what was seen and what was unseen. The veil hung there declaring no access, no public access, invitation only. And this went on for thousands of years, for, for generations, sacrifices for the sins of the people, the washing, the bread, the light, the incense, the, the once a year. This went on for generation after generation. High priests would be born and they would die and then another high priest would take their place and this went on and it went on and it went on. But all this changed on one day in the Middle Eastern sun as a man hung from a Roman cross. Jesus, the Son of God, had been beaten and mocked and paraded publicly through the streets. He was stumbled his way up to a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there he was nailed to a cross and raised up in front of all so they could see. And he survived there for hours, struggling through the physical trauma of not being able to breathe and struggling through all that his body had endured. And about three o'clock that afternoon, he raised himself up and gasped for breath and yelled, It is finished! And then passed. And he died. Now Jesus knew this was going to happen. He had predicted that this was going to happen. He came to live and live in such a way to show us how to live, what it looked like to follow God. He also came to die and to offer himself as a sacrifice. And he came to do something that the tabernacle had declared generations previously. Jesus was on a mission. You see, throughout time, the tabernacle and later the temple, the people always needed a high priest, a mediator, to go through the intricate rituals and all the cleansings and sacrifices so that God's forgiveness could be for them for another year. It provided them a way to live free from the guilt of sin because someone else went into the presence of God on their behalf. It was always temporary. It always had to be renewed. You had a year, and then the next Yom Kippur, once again, the high priest would pass through every section and then go in on your behalf for your forgiveness and forgiveness of all the people who were waiting outside. It was constant. It was consistent. There was a need there because there was no permanent solution for the answer to sin of humanity. But Jesus came and did something once and for all, separating us from the sin and the curse of our guilt. Jesus came to do the work for us. Not as a high priest, but as the high priest, the final mediator. It was when Jesus said, it is finished. It was about a lot more than just his death. There was a lot of things that were finished. The entire system and requirements was finished and a new way had come. After his death on the cross, there was no more need for the altar and the labor. There was no more need for this system and the blood and the incense there was no more need for mediators. Like all high priests before him, he went where we could not go and he did what we could not do on our behalf. Only he didn't come with the sacrifice of a sheep and the blood of a sheep. He came as the Lamb of God with his own blood and his own sacrifice, giving us access once and for all. But it makes you wonder, because we're here in Exodus, we're finishing up the Holy of, we're finishing up the Holy of Holies and the tabernacle. It makes you wonder, what happened to this? This sacred room, this, the ark, the, the veil, the curtain. What about that veil that separated these two rooms, that separated the unseen from the seen? I mean, all these furnishings point forward to Jesus, and beyond that, point forward to you and your life right here today. So what is this veil? I mean, we're going to look at a curtain today. I mean, usually, man, if someone says, we're going to look at curtains today, it's like, oh, great. Oh, 
My wife had said that to me. Okay, we're looking at curtains today. We're going to look at a curtain, a veil. And we're going to see something today that's going to hopefully bring a new life and understanding to what Jesus has done for you. Did you know that this veil right here is mentioned in the New Testament? In fact, the veil gives us a striking and astounding insight into the work of Jesus in God's plan all the way back to the tabernacle. It's something that can be relevant today. So I want to dive deeper into this veil as we've gone through the tabernacle and stop right here. But first, I want to tell you something. The tabernacle, by the time that Jesus walked the earth, there was no more tabernacle. The tabernacle was a mobile temple for a nomadic people in Exodus and as they traveled through the wilderness. But once the nation was established, almost a thousand years before Jesus, 3,000 years before we sit here today, once that happened, they didn't need a mobile tabernacle. Instead, they needed something more permanent, a permanent structure for God's presence. And so God gave Moses, you know, back in Exodus, the detailed instructions for the tabernacle. But we find that God gave King David detailed instructions for a temple. In fact, he said this to his son Solomon. He, David said, every part of this plan was given to me in writing by the hand of God. And Solomon, his son, was the one who built the temple. The temple is very similar, although it's different in ornamentation. It's much more complex. It was much larger in scale. It's the difference between how if you go stay in a hotel for a while, how you decorate that, and then when you finally get your new home and how you begin to settle in and decorate that. The temple was the home. It was permanent. They moved, God moved in. And so there was much more, uh, there was ornate decorations, uh, complexity, amazing things. It It was a breathtaking structure to behold. But the sacredness and the function was the same. Even these were the same, and you still had to pass through the altar, the laver, the bread was there, the light, the incense, and then, of course, the veil and the holy of holies. And there in the temple, while Jesus walked the earth, was the veil and the holy of holies. Instead of being a a small curtain, though, in a desert tabernacle, I want you to listen to the words of an ancient sage as he discusses and he gives us insight into what the veil was like in the, the temple. Listen to this, quote, the curtain itself was a handbreadth thick, and it was woven on 72 strands, each strand consisting of 24 threads. Its length was 40 cubits, and its width was 20 cubits. 40 cubits in length, that is, means from ceiling to floor, 60 feet. It was 60 feet from the top to the bottom. 20 cubits wide, it was 30 feet from side to side, and a handbreadth thick, it was four inches thick. This curtain, this veil was heavy and formidable, 60 feet and four inches thick. And this temple veil was there in the temple while Jesus hung on the cross. So back to those final moments of Jesus. Let's go to Matthew 27, verse 50. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And listen to the next sentence. And the moment of his death, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The moment Jesus died, this separating veil that had been there for generation upon generation to divide divinity from humanity was torn from top to bottom. And it's not only that it's gone, I want us to slow down and I want you to lean in and I want you to catch this because there's something in the details that's astounding. This, this thick veil, how was it torn? It tells us, 60 feet tall. It was torn from top to bottom. So, so listen closely, how was it ripped? If a human, if a human had gone in that temple and, and gone to the bottom of that 60-foot curtain and, and grabbed the bottom of it, right, and began to rip this four-inch thick, they would have began to rip down here and they would have torn it up. A human would have ripped this from the bottom to the top. But let me just give you a little spoiler. The disciples didn't sneak inside the temple and rip this veil. And and not only that, the priests of the temple, they would have given their lives to defend someone walking in and desecrating the temple in this way. So who went in there? Who tore the veil? And how could someone do such a thing? I mean, I don't know a human that could tear a four-inch thick veil curtain from the, bottom, from the top to the bottom. 
The Bible tells us it was ripped. But who, who tore this veil? It was torn from top to bottom. It was torn from heaven to earth. Ripped from the top to the bottom. God himself tore open this veil. And in doing so, God declared, let there be no longer be any barrier between my presence and the people. The separation was gone. God's prophets for hundreds of years had, had gone on and on, hundreds upon hundreds of years, and talked about how someone was coming. There was someone coming who would do an incredible work that would change everything. The Messiah. And at that moment, on the cross, when Jesus died, the veil was torn. And when that veil was torn, something changed for you and for me. And it has to do with access. No more sacrifice once a year in the Holy of Holies. No waiting for a priest to walk in there on a certain day of a year to offer a sacrifice for, for us as we waited on the outside. Jesus, our high priest, the mediator, he came to earth. In 1 Timothy 2.5 it says, God desires that everyone be saved and understand the truth, that there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile, make right God and humanity. That's the man Je Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. The mediator, Jesus, who on the cross reconciled us, made us right. Jesus, the high priest, the mediator, because of his sacrifice, gave us access to the presence of the Father. Jesus doesn't have to go to the Holy of Holies once a year as a sacrifice. He went there as the sacrifice. And when he died, that veil, the barrier between humanity and divinity was torn. And because of Jesus' sacrifice, you now have access to something that for generations they didn't have access to. But, but remember how dangerous it was for the high priest to even, even the high priest himself to go in, let alone anyone else. Could you imagine being out here and just wanting to go in there? It, it, it's foolish. Remember the ropes? Remember the bells? I, I mean, what, what does access look like for us? How do we enter this? Hebrews 10, 19 says this, Brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's holy of holies because of the blood of Jesus. It's a New Testament writing that we can enter the holy of holies. By what? By the blood, by the sacrifice of Jesus. And how are we told we can enter? It says boldly. The Greek word here means confidence, freedom, and it also means a cheerful courage. That you can enter into the presence of God with a cheerful courage. Not because of the work you've done, but because somebody went there for you and opened the way. You don't enter God's presence afraid that he's mad at you. And this is my question for many of us. How do you view, how do you think of God? How do you, what do you think God thinks about you? This morning, how do you think God thinks about you? He crossed arms, looking down his, oh, there you are. Back again, huh? Same old, same old, isn't it? Mess it up again? You back? Well, this time you're going to have to pay even more penance. Like, how do you think God thinks about you? That's a really important question. You're here right now, or you're with us online, or listening later. How do you think God thinks of you? I don't enter in anywhere with cheerful courage if I have a God who's going, huh? There you go. Like, how do you enter into the principal's office? With cheerful courage? No. Many of you never went there. Yes, I have my own little chair there. But you don't enter it with cheerful courage and boldly. How do you think God thinks about you? Tabernacle was made open because of Jesus, his sacrifice. And we can go with cheerful assurance because of his work. Hebrews 10 goes on. It says, Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. Like he did this. The veil into God's presence is his body. And was Jesus torn? Yes. To give us access to God's presence. The veil is no longer the division between you and God's presence. There's no more physical veil. There's no high priestly mediator needed why? Because Jesus made the way. He is the access point to God's presence. 
John 14, 6, uh, Jesus says this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father, the presence, except for through me. Ephesians 2.18 says, through Jesus, we all have access to the Father. No more rituals, sacrifices, or offerings. We have full access because of what Jesus has done, not by our good works. You don't earn your way in on this whole thing. No, no, it's because of what Jesus has done. Jesus is saying that he's the final high priest, the final sacrifice. Listen to this in Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in Jesus and through no one else. For there's no other name that has been given or will be given to us by which we can be saved, only one, Jesus. He has given us access and salvation. At the cross, the veil was torn. And his presence, God's presence, is now accessible. Jesus, the way and the truth and the life. And this is so important. This is so important because a lot of times in religions and even the religion of churchianity, we are told that Jesus gives us access to a destination. And some people get saved to get to heaven. Now, that's part of what Jesus offers us, but that's not what he came to give us. We don't, we don't follow Jesus so we just get heaven someday. It's not about a destination. It's that we get access to the Father's presence now. He gives us life and life to the full now. Jesus doesn't say he's the path to the place. He's a path to the presence of God. Now, thanks be to Jesus that he does give us access to eternity. But here on earth, this is good news. That in your life today and tomorrow, you have access to God's presence that people thousands of years ago could only dream about. To offer the cross is just that. It's access to the Father. Because of the Son, you have full access. Listen, here's another verse, Hebrews 4, 16. Listen to this. We can now approach God's throne, His presence, with confidence. There's that word, boldly, confidence, cheerful courage, again, do you go to God's throne? Do you go to God's presence because you go to church? Maybe you give some money and, and you don't sin too big? No. We don't approach God's throne and God's presence because of our good works. We approach God's throne, His presence, because of the work His Son Jesus has done for us. It's not based on our work. It's based on His. Ephesians 3.12. There's so many verses I could just keep going and going. Because of Jesus and our faith in Him, we can access God with freedom and confidence. And for many of you, this is what I want to continue to, to show you today, is that, listen, and I'm going, to, I'm going to preach myself out of a job, you don't need me. You don't need me, and you don't need a priest, and you don't need anybody. You need Jesus. Jesus went where we could not go to give us access and do things we could not do, and because of him, you have all you need. You don't need me to go to God for you. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a minister. You don't need a prophet. You don't need any of that. You have Jesus who went to the place and did it all once and for all. And it says he gives us freedom and confidence, access with God with freedom and confidence. Now, freedom from what? Freedom from your past sin. That for many of you walked in. You walked in defining yourself by your sin. And this tells you it's time to define yourself by his son. Let me just say it one more time. Many of you engage in this and you come into church or when you think about how God thinks about you you, you, you engage him based on defining yourself by your sin. It's time to start defining yourself by his son who did the work to give you access. He gives us freedom from our past sin, freedom from our shame and guilt, freedom from our anxiety and fears and vices and insecurities and angers, the things that hold us back because none of those things disqualify us from God's presence. And to, to finish this, I know there are a lot of us in here who are new or newer. And perhaps you haven't settled this whole Jesus thing yet. You're checking it out. You're kicking the tires on the orchard and this whole God thing. And that's fine. Continue to do so. We are glad you're here and you just keep checking it out. But I want you to know something. That we're not, and the Bible does not ask you to come and conform to a religion. It asks you to come and be transformed by Jesus. And he died to give you access to God, freedom from your past. He came to give you peace in your present and hope in your future. And if you're here today and you want to pray to receive Jesus as your Savior, if you want to settle that, I'm going to have some of my friends, um, some men and women in the back a corner over here, our prayer team, to pray with you. And I would encourage you to stand during this next song and go over there and say, I want to pray to receive this Jesus. 
because he gave me access. For others of us, you know Jesus. Let's say that you, you received Jesus a long time ago. It was church camp. You threw a stick in a fire. You got baptized. You did something a long time ago. This, you've been saved. You know, you know Jesus, and you know you're forgiven. But you got to admit, you don't, you don't know. You don't know that you're forgiven. There's a difference between what, what you may say you have in your head and what we feel and experience in our hearts and our spirit. For those of you who, who you know Jesus, but man, you have drifted and you've wandered and you're wondering what God thinks about you. I'll tell you, he, he loves you. He, he sings songs of rejoicing over you and he calls you and welcomes you home and watches for you. He doesn't meet you with closed arms. He waits for you with open arms because his son died for you. And if you're here today and you're re-engaging or you want to re-engage in your faith, I want you to, listen, during this first song, as you, as you take communion, I want you to sit there with the elements and I want you to pause and I want you to thank Jesus for his, his sacrifice. I want you to ask forgiveness for your sins. Then I want you to praise him because the body and the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice have separated you from that. And then take communion. And finally, for another group of us who are following Jesus, tomorrow in your devotional time, your prayer time, your word, your prayer, however you do it, I, I want you to try something. I want, I, want you to, I, want you, I want you to literally imagine some of this, accessing the presence of God. Because you are able to walk through, because you know the Son, you can walk through every section into the presence of God, and He welcomes you. So don't pray a laundry list of needs and just read the Bible looking for a nugget for the day. Go into God's word looking for his nature and pray and seek his presence. As we sing this song, Holy, 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 I was reminded in the first service that in heaven, we are told that the angels at this moment, at this moment are singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. And as we sing this song, we're going to echo with them the very worship that they are singing. And also in, in Revelation, it describes Jesus, and you'll see it in this song, how he is clothed, and, and it talks about lightning and rainbow and all these things, and it's straight out of Revelation, and what Jesus is like now in his glorified state. And I just want to say, we have a Jesus, we have a Savior who we'll see someday in a whole new way. And as we worship, and as you stand and engage, you can worship knowing you have full access to God's presence, because of what Jesus has done. So let's get communion. Let's pray. Prayer team in the back. If you're online with us, you can message us a prayer or give a prayer there in the comments. But let's engage with how God would have us do it.